It's time for this week's Prairie Cast. Instead of coming and just saying, hey, we need money for marketing. Putting, putting together the plan and then come to the station of Prairie Cast. Like, uh, today I will be your host for the first part of it and we'll move into the regular Prairie Cast this afternoon. Uh, I am Danny Schreiber with Silicon Prairie News. If you don't know about us, we're a news blog here uh, in the heart of the Midwest. We cover the startup activity in Des Moines, Omaha, and Kansas City. And we hold a couple events as well, Think Iowa and then Big Omaha. Uh, today we're in Startup City, Des Moines, which is an incubator here on really in downtown Des Moines, it's, it's been tagged as Silicon Six. Uh, there's eight startups that work out of here. Um, for those of you watching on the live stream today, uh, they're right in front of us as well. So they'll be participating in the Q&A later. Uh, I want to thank very much Startup City for hosting us. Um, also Christopher New and John Thompson for producing today's uh, live stream. And then lastly, I wanted to thank Dwala for having us be a part of this and having everybody over here today and, and you guys taking time out of your day. So without further ado, let's bring on Dwala and our couple of guests today. We've got Ben Mill, uh, the co-founder and CEO of Dwala. Want to join us out here, Ben? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. And then also Ashton Kutcher is here as well with us today. Uh, an Iowa native, uh, an investor, actor. Um, Ashton, welcome to Preguest. Thanks. Like we and shake hands, we know each other pretty well. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> All right, so we'll get things started. Huh? <laughs> okay, so uh, we've got viewers uh, here in Des Moines. We've got you know, the, the crew here um, and in the region, but today I think we got a little bit broader audience. So we've got some news to, go, to talk about today, but also, we want to introduce uh, Dwala, and then we also want to introduce A grade. So, let's first off with the news. Why are we? What's going on today? What are we here for? Well, Ashton invested in Dwala, um, which I think is pretty sweet. Um, I think that's kind of like the news. We're just admitting it today. <laughs> <laughs> is this uh, a new announcement? A different round? Or is this uh, go back to uh, February when we announced the uh, the funding, yeah. the Series B? Yeah, this is part of the Series B stuff. Okay. So we participated uh, in the Series B also. Um, Union Square Ventures led that round. Um, so then briefly, uh, we're, we want to get into the backstory because uh, here we've got uh, two Iowa natives. But could you give us a, a real brief description of Dwala, especially for those who hadn't heard about it before? This is not for the people in the room. Right? No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> no, so Dwala is a payment network that basically bypasses the existing credit card networks. Um, and also improves kind of the way banks transfer money um, by doing it faster, more securely, more cheaply. And what year did you found Walla? Man, I've been doing this like four years, but we released nationally in December of 2010. Okay, and how many employees are you at now? We have to ask Sharice. 20? 20. 20. Okay, 20 is the number. Yep. Uh, and the uh, something that's quite memorable as well, what's the cost to transfer money between two individuals? So it's uh, 25 cents if it's over 10 bucks, and if it's under $10, it's totally free. All right. Let's go over to you, Ashton. Uh, A-grade investments. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, uh, about A-grade and about how uh, you invested in Dwala? Yeah, A-grade is an uh, uh, investment fund. Uh, it's myself, my partner Guy Osiri, and Ron Burkle, it's the three of us. Um, and uh, we, we do primarily investments, angel investments, seed round, series A, series B, uh, in companies that solve problems. Um, mostly consumer facing companies, um, from anything from social networks to e-commerce to payment, but consumer facing companies, technology companies. And some of those would be Airbnb, Hitmonk? Yeah, I started investing in technologies probably about five years ago. I uh, invested in Skype when it sold from eBay, and then uh, and then started making angel investments about four years ago. Uh, first investment was in Foursquare, and uh, as an angel, and then followed up with a Series A, and then uh, and then invested in Airbnb, Hipmonk, Fab, Spotify, a couple other companies. Yeah. And then you yourself have Catalyst Media, and you've uh, presented TechCrunch Disrupt before, so you've been really in the startup scene as well as part of the, the team. Yeah, I have a I have a 
digital media company uh, as well as a physical production company uh, that, that I'm one of the founders of and uh, have been, you know, have been in and around technology since I went to the University of Iowa School of Engineering. So. Uh, you're a, you went to Northern Iowa, actually both uh, college dropouts, so you have this, something in common as well. How did you end up crossing paths? Um, so we met through a mutual friend um, that, you know, I met through SPN actually and like the Startup Weekend guys and all that stuff. Um, that's kind of, I mean, we met through a mutual friend and then we got together around like Thanksgiving of this year. Just like, I shouldn't have to be in Iowa, so it worked out well. Yeah, I invested in a company called Zarly about a year and a half ago. I met him at Startup Weekend, met with Bo, well, I'd met Bo before through the Summit Series guys, and uh, and we connected really quick. I, I liked his vision, his company. And then Bo told me uh, about Dwala, and I heard that it was in Iowa when I was coming back for Thanksgiving uh, to see my family, and we set up a meeting. I had a whiteboard. And with yeah, I had to go to Target to buy a whiteboard. <laughs> yeah, we had, to go to, <laughs> we had to buy a whiteboard and started cranking on it. Where was the where did the meeting take place? You went to Target about a whiteboard like the first meeting was in my brother's house, the second meeting was in my dad's garage. <laughs> yeah. did, had a couple beers and a whiteboard and started cranking. Is this the first uh, pitch you received in your dad's garage or have you seen other startup pitches there? Uh, it's the first pitch my dad. <laughs> I, I well I, I, I there was a small motor repair company I got a pitch for. Oh. My dad's garage <laughs> passed on that one. <laughs> Jumped in on the wall. <laughs> now, um, I want to uh, take back because uh, you're a native of Cedar Rapids um, and you've been back to Iowa. You spotted at the uh, University of Iowa Games. Um, in uh, 2008, uh, I was looking back at some of the coverage of the Iowa City flood and then your involvement. You came back graciously, were a part of the recovery there. Uh -huh. uh, one thing I thought that was notable, you said, uh, you said that uh, Iowa's greatest natural resource isn't the corn, you said it's the people. Um, and you said that you truly believe in the people in Iowa and that are from Iowa. They aren't the type of people who, who go, when a problem hits, they don't go out and say, give me, give me, give me. They go out and they look for solutions for themselves and they say, if people want to help, great. So look at the situation with Douala here um, and looking to solve, really disrupt the <coughs> industry. What, what attracted you to, to Douala in this? I have some companies that I think solve problems that are disruptive and that help people. Um, and if you look at the global economy right now and you look at what's happening with Occupy Wall Street and what's, ha what's happening on, on the streets and, and, and the sort of credit card crisis that people are in across the, com across the country, you go, okay, well, it's all fine to you know, carry a poster and complain about it and tell a CEO you should be getting paid less. But who's actually doing something to solve that problem? And when I really started to look at that landscape and go, okay, this Occupy Wall Street thing's bubbling up, but clearly there's a problem here, and started investigating about, well, you know, where are some of the gaps and what are some of the things that can be done to create solutions. And then, and, and then when I was introduced to Douala, it, it actually presented a solution to a, a realistic, real-world solution to an antiquated architecture in finance that just has to go. Uh, Y y and, and to me, that, that's a really attractive company. To me, that's a company that is going to have to fight like hell because there's a lot of institutions that exist that are not going to want that company to be the standard. But that being said, it's a company that when it does become the standard, and it will, because the, mi the minority will always become the majority, when it does become the standard, it's a company that will be very, very valuable and actually help people in their lives and, and put money back in people's pockets, and I like that. So, Benny, you hear Ashton say that, talk about institutions don't want to see that happen, but you did this in Des Moines, Iowa, with uh, a couple of financial, established financial institutions that helped make it happen. Uh, what does that mean to you to hear what Ashton's belief in what you're doing? Well, I mean, it's good. It feels good to, like, hear validation from people that aren't here. I mean, I think we all kind of know that there's probably a little bit of trouble when you get started of people kind of just, just, like, pat you on the back too much and say, good job, kid. You don't really need that, right? takes a long time to kind of get to the point of, okay, well, the idea works, it's off and running, it's not vaporware, the solution's real. And when the market and, you know, obviously um, other people start to see the solution that we see, that, that kind of gives us a little bit 
more confidence, obviously, just to drive a little bit faster. I mean, and, and the real quick, I mean, I'm sure there's people out there watching online that don't necessarily know what Tawala is and know what it's about. It's a payment network, right? It's a payment network that combines a lot of antiquated systems into one and removes copious amounts of cost, right? So every time anybody makes a financial transaction, whether it's in the real world or whether it's online, there are all of these payments that ultimately are getting stripped out of it, right? Fees upon fees upon fees, whether it's credit card fees or transaction fees or whatever it is. And those fees that actually come inside of those transactions, they're micro fees, but they add up and they add up really quickly. And so what Dwala really is is a payments network that allows people to exchange money without all of those fees. And then on top of that, it also really eliminates the paper, the vapor trail that comes off of every payment that you make. So every time someone makes a payment or a transaction, transaction, there's vapor that comes out of that, and that vapor that's coming out of it is all of your information, which exposes you to fraudulent situations and exposes you to the liabilities that come with that and massive amounts of costs that are incurred in order to prevent that. So from fraud prevention costs to the actual physical cost of fraud, I mean, I think it was, we were talking... It's it was like, like eight like, billion is the actual annual cost of like fraud. Eight billion dollars yep. a year. 40 some 40 plus billion dollars in transaction fees annually and that's not really even including all of the all the costs that actually go in from the credit card companies and, and so on and so forth to actually defend against that fraud that's taking place and so all those costs ultimately come back to people and what Dwala does is it eliminates that it eliminates a the vapor trail that comes off i mean sure people are still going to be attacking in different ways for fraud but at least it takes an institution that's exposing us consistently and constantly every time you make a transaction to fraud. It, it eliminates that. And secondly, it eliminates all of those transaction fees. And, and all of that cost ultimately come back to the people. So that's what Dwala really does. So um, Dwala has been, a, a, that pitch has been said to a number of businesses here in Des Moines. At, at one time, Des Moines actually, here in the Harlem Midwest, Des Moines, the number one user of Dwala. Anyway. Yeah, it used to be. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Or, or fortunately, I guess that's not the case <laughs> anymore. But um, for a long time, definitely Des Moines was kind of like that's where everything was coming from. I mean, everything started here for sure. Uh, things don't often, so we look at uh, Pinterest keeps hitting the news. Uh, a lot of users early on uh, for Pinterest happened, came out of Iowa. Uh, but how do you, and this is uh, something you've been involved with in the past, Ashton, with Skype was let's get this into the mainstream. So where do you go next to talk about getting this message uh, into the mainstream? So that way, if I'm in Des Moines or if I'm in Minneapolis or if I'm in LA, the wall is going to be accepted at the coffee shop or the business center. Well, first things first, you have to explain to people why it's advantageous to use it, right? Dwala sells itself. Uh, you, don't, you don't need somebody to go out and tell you why to use Dwala once you know what Dwala is. And I think what happens is when you, as soon as you get into payments and transaction and banks, and I mean, there's the reason why people go into such crazy credit card debt is because they don't read that long piece of paper with all the bullshit that comes with it, right? Well, Dwala takes that piece of paper and tears it up. And it says every transaction is 25 cents if it's over $10, right? And it makes it really, really simple, right? So that first and foremost, I think, is something that, that, that will, once people start to understand the value of that, the product will mainstream itself. I mean, if you look at the average restaurant here, right? They're making about $70,000 a month, right, in, in, in gross profits, right? But 3% of that is their net profit. Well, if you look at that month, 3.6% of all the transactions, 3.6% is the transaction costs that take place. They can more than double their profits monthly just by using Dwala as a payment system. So if you're a restauranteur and you're sitting there and you go, okay, well, you can pay credit card, you can pay Dwala. You want people to pay Dwala because you're going to double your profits. And that's, I mean, if you look across the country at the, the, the number of people, well, that's money that goes into people's pockets. And that's money that goes back into the economy. That's money that keeps churning. And actually, like, when you look at Occupy Wall Street and you look at the problem that people are having and you go, okay, where are some solutions? You look at Dwala and you go, well, that's a real viable solution to putting money back in people's pockets. And I, I think Dwala sells itself. I think it's just a matter of, A, people know that it exists, be understanding the architecture and how it exists and why it's valuable to them. 
and then and then and then watching people use it. And what you know, the mobile the mobile mobile phone exchange of cash is going to happen. We, I mean, there's so many people vying for the space, and there are a lot of MSPs that are doing it from Square to PayPal, to this one to that one, and, and, and you can't confuse Dwalla with that, right? Because those MSPs are still relying on the credit card companies to make the transaction take place, whereas Dwalla doesn't. It's, it's a bank-to-bank -bank transfer in a way that actually cuts out, A, all of the fraudulent potential of any exchange, and B, those transaction fees. So when you really start to look at holistic solutions, it's Dwalla, and, and, and people are going to see it. And, and, and listen, it's pretty freaking cool, right? So you walk into a coffee shop and you hit a button and all of a sudden this exchange takes place. Well, that's pretty damn cool. And I think that once people start to see that happen, and they see, and, and the merchants are going to be encouraged to use Dwalla as that solution, as opposed to one of these MSPs, because of the savings that's going to come back to them in doing so, I just think it's going to happen. I think it's just going to be a standard. So uh, in December, uh, Dwalla rolls out Instant, which mm -hmm. is a line of credit um, up to three hundred dollars. So it's up to up to five hundred. Up to five hundred dollars. Yep. Okay. Um, and around that time, you wrote a letter. You wrote an open letter on your blog. Somehow you found time, like the week of the launch, to write an open letter to Louis C.K. Remember what that letter was about? So I think Jordan actually wrote that. Okay, Jordan wrote that. Yeah. So open letter to Louis C.K. Five dollars he's selling his latest stand-up for. Yeah. Um, could you see this working in the media industry? You've talked about the newspapers before, possibly using it for the monthly subscription fees. So, I mean, I don't know who, who's that. I mean, the answer is absolutely. I mean, the fees are lower, <laughs> or it's free. I mean, if, even if you're a media company, you're selling songs for, or you're selling any, any type of media, right? It could be music, it could be print, it could be anything. If it's 99 cents, well, your, your margin goes way up when it's a free transaction, right? Especially when you multiply that by, you know, a few billion. So I, I think it makes a lot of sense there. Yeah, so media industry, where do you, do you see Dwalla? Do you see Louis C.K. seeing the value there? Aziz Sansari just released his five minute or five dollar stand up as well. I think it. I think it exists everywhere. I mean, I, I. I don't think that there's. I mean, when I look at companies, I assess companies to invest in, right? The biggest thing I'm looking for is something that's creating a holistic solution in some way, shape, or form, right? So if I look at Airbnb and I assess that versus other companies that are the Airbnb of, whatever that industry is, if that industry itself isn't large enough to actually return on the risk, right? Because every time you make an investment in a startup, right, you're, you're taking a big risk. You don't know. I mean, it's, it's, you're starting from nothing. You're starting from dust and you have to build it and you have to depend on the fact that the founder can be a leader of a great company. You have to depend on the, you have to depend on the, 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 the fact that, that they can efficiently actually build a company and execute on the idea that they have, right? So you're taking a giant risk. And when you take that risk, you're looking at the market value that they're actually that they can potentially you know extrapolate cash from at some point in time and if that market isn't large enough then the investment isn't worth it well Dwalla's holistic i mean i think it sits i, I think it can sit on top of a, a, every single transaction that takes place from yeah. consumer to bank to bank to bank to to, I, to yeah i mean i, I don't mean to like inter uh, every transaction could inevitably settle on Dwalla. It's faster, it's more efficient, and it's more secure. There's no reason that when you pay off your credit card, you're not using Dwalla without even knowing it because it's faster. It's inevitable that as the platform scales, banks start to leverage it just the same, and it just starts to find its way into everything. Security uh, question. Um, anything there that uh, will be addressed in a new release? Um, or Grid came out. We've seen some implementations. So what aspect is security? Right? So, I mean, Part of the pitch um, that you would give over to the consumer that will be using it? So, I mean, security plays a really important role, and that's, that's scaling really well for us right now. Um, we're finding that the decisions we made from an architecture perspective really early on were the right decisions. I mean, utilizing OAuth instead of a 16-digit account number for payments, not a lot of people have, have been doing that, and we're starting to see it start to show up in a lot of applications, and I mean, like, that was absolutely the right move. And um, as we're finding people actually do give a shit about their information being secure, um, they're just not aware how insecure every time they pay is, right? Um, and there's not a lot of people that I think have really tried to drive that home of like every time you make a payment, you're leaving behind a 16 digit account number where it's relayed to 20 people you never see who can then pick it up at any given point in time and then buy stuff with your credit card number. 
And it's, it's not just you know credit, it's a whole 16 digit number system. So let's do a quick poll of the audience. Who here uses Duala as a consumer? All right, about 80% for those watching the web. How about as a business? Do you take it as a business? About 15 people, all right. I want to uh, step back to the investment. Uh, ben, uh, one story that came out uh, before the round was closed was that you had a, a list of 400 you know, investors interested in this. How did you end up picking uh, Ashton? What was what really drew you to Ashton? Well, I mean, let's be just honest about something like when your name shows up on a list, like it sticks out. So, <laughs> I mean, let's be honest about that. And I think that, you know, there's, I know that Ashton as an investor is brilliant. And it took me a while to actually understand that because I didn't know anything about you, right? And so the first thing I actually did was call, like, call a few people and just kind of ask around. And I asked Bo very point blank, like, was this, like, what is the value, right? Is it, is it branding? What is the value? And as I'm finding, like, Ashton is absolutely brilliant on product. Like, there are, like, changes that seem very obvious to you that don't seem obvious to me. Um, and that came out really quickly after, you know, we spent a couple hours together. I mean, it wasn't show me your deck. It was let's argue about it and put it up on the whiteboard. And, like, that's a really productive conversation for me. And you also have Mark Echo involved uh, yep. in, the, in the branding effort as well. Uh, we want to go to a Q&A here shortly, um, but uh, I also uh, want to address one more question here. We, we've, they've got to take off. Uh, they've got strategy sessions this afternoon. So can you take us into that room? Uh, just humor us with, with what's going to go on. What, what's going to be the feedback for Ben today? What would be talked about um, as you have time here in person with Ben? What do you mean? Well, uh, I spent three hours in the office yesterday. Yeah, you mind if I kind of run with that for a minute? Yeah, sure. So, like, <laughs> like you connect Twitter, shit breaks, right? Like, when you start searching, the number of, like, queries on the database totally changes from a regular, like, account holder. Like, that's stuff we never see. That's stuff that we can't necessarily duplicate on a live system. So, like, you know, we actually get to see a perspective of, well, this is what I wanted to do, and it's not working. And if you sit down to send money to someone, I think everybody in the office would like that to work, right? And, you know, I think that there's things that just come to the surface really quickly. And it's coming from someone whose opinion we respect greatly. And it's also not feedback that just isn't helpful. Anybody can sit down and say, like, this color is shit, right? But it takes a very interesting person to be able just to stick right to what matters about the product and focus directly on that. And I mean, I'd like to think that our, our time talking about product is pretty heavily focused time. Um, and it'll have ripple effects for us for the next three months about what we work on. Ash, and there's reports you work with 40 startup companies. I'm curious, what's the breakdown of time that you're, you're able to dedicate to, to those companies? How much time will you spend this month with Dewalla? Um Well, I, I, part, part of how I break it down is based on the level of investment I have in, in a given company. Um, part of it is is based on where their needs are and whether or not it's something. I mean, there's some companies I work with that, you know, I'll get an email and say, hey, we'd like to do this and get to know this person and I can make an introduction. And People and answer your phone calls? What do you mean? <laughs> I think you said that in a previous interview where you have the ability to, to get on people's radar. Apparently, my name shows up on a list <laughs> and it sticks out. I, you know, I mean, some of it's just that, right? Which is, hey, I'd like to meet this person. Some of it is, um, you know, as far as subsequent rounds of funding go, right? I'm, I'm, I'm relatively connected with most of the VCs and most of the angels that are in the Valley or in New York. Um, I'm connected with startups in uh, some startups in Europe, and I have startups on the West Coast and the East Coast and the Midwest, and 
and, and part of it is just about having that network available to you. Part of it is about having a whole different network that has absolutely nothing to do with that because sometimes growing a company takes partners and strategic partners and strategic thought about how you're going to work with those partners and whether or not they're going to be value add or they're going to extract value from the company. Um, and so, you know, some of my time is spent doing that, and 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 then uh, and then a lot of my time is actually spent just using products and thinking about the way that people use products. I mean, at the end of the day, the reason why I like working with consumer companies and why I think I'm I'm better at that than you know B two B or or something else enterprise companies is that I use products as a consumer and I want to feel it and I want to know. All right, how many clicks is it going to take me to get from here to here? I mean, one of the things we were working on yesterday was, you know, you step into a store, how many clicks does it take you to actually make that transfer? And who's doing the work and how much work and how, how can we make it more efficient and eliminate a step in the process? And what do we need in the process and what can we get rid of in the process and maybe bring in later? And th those types of things really matter um, because if you use something and it's easy and clean and it's intuitive and it's and it feels like something you've done before or part of who you are but but it's creating magic for you those are products that people are going to want to use and so i spend a lot of time thinking about it it's 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 really similar to being an actor in 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 that when you take on a character you're taking on somebody else and so you think about how they do things or why they do things or and 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 look at, and I look at a product I break down a product the same way I would break down a character that I was going to play and and try to get inside of the mind of that person the user the consumer and figure out why they're doing something and what they want from it and why they would want it and what is their motivation as they go through here and and what's the path of least resistance to actually get them to their end goal and and so I spent a ton of time actually just using stuff and then giving that feedback and, and seeing what people think. I mean, my ideas are just ideas like anybody else's. So some of them would be really bad. <laughs> Jordan, uh, time for audience questions? Yeah, we got a few minutes left. Okay, up for some audience questions? Yeah. Speaking to it. Uh, yeah. Questions, um, and we just shout them out actually. Oh, and I can repeat. Hey, I'm Emma Peterson. I have a startup called Tickly. We're based out of Startup City. Um, our whole focus is placing tickets back in the hands of the artist, venue, or event organizer, and we're the first ticketing company to be fully integrated with Dwalla. So as I've learned and studied you know, at the feet of Ben and been a, had some really great friendship with him, he's constantly taught us, I think all of us, to hustle, to be passionate, and to not lose sight of what you're headed after, right? So my question might be for both of you, but honestly, it might be for you, Ben, which is how do you not lose everything that is Ben Milne and that is Dwalla and has brought you thus far? Those are kind of things that have really impacted me particularly when you're bringing on various investors, Ashton included. So when you find investors, mentors, and advisors, you're not looking for someone to direct your life, right? Mm -hmm. You're looking for people to buy into the vision that you see and then kind of act as bumpers for you to keep you going in that direction, right? Um, and I'm really thankful and quite frankly damn lucky that I've somehow find myself with a lot of really good people around who are doing exactly that for me, which is not how do I change you, it's how do I help you get where you're going? And at the same time, I'm okay if you didn't wear a tie today, right? I mean, being okay with who you are as a person and being able to like trust in that, I guess. Ashley, you have anything to add to that? Uh, Iowa roots or where you grew up? Well, if you have an investor that's you know, wanting you to do things that you're not, it's not part of your vision of your company, don't take their money. Agreed. Um, at the end of the day, you'll just end up being miserable. I mean, what, it, what happens if that disagreement happens after you two have gotten together? I mean, you got to Tell them to get the hell out. <laughs> <laughs> They're your investor. You already got their money. <laughs> Tell them to get lost. I mean, they, they, they don't have, I, I have no rights over what Dwala does, right? I have no, like, I mean, I, I, I don't have a board seat, you know? It's like, think about your board. If, you're gonna, if they're demanding a board seat, make sure that's somebody whose vision you're aligned with or who understands your vision implicitly, but just tell me to get lost. I mean, I, I have investor rights. I get to know what's going on with the company. I get to know what financially is going on with the company. I can't tell them what to do. 
Uh, any other questions? Jordan, cut me off when. I think we got time for one more. Okay, question, that one, Matthew. Uh, my name is Matthew Smith. I'm also another resident here at Startup City, and my startup is Real Estate Fan Pages. Ultimately, we're trying to reduce friction in the real estate market by creating a more efficient platform on Facebook to connect real estate professionals, buyers, and sellers. Um, one of my questions is, as an early stage startup, uh, key to our growth strategy is identifying early brand advocates and empowering those advocates to be able to be the voice of your company, thus being able to spread the message more. So with companies that you work with, like Zarly and others, I'd like to hear if you could share some of the most uh, effective means of identifying those brand advocates and also empowering them to share the message. Well, your best brand advocates are going to be your passionate users, right? Um, you know, I don't think for startups, spending it, you know, it, I think I think tapping in and I mean it's really about knowing your consumer, right? If you know your consumer and you really know them well, uh, you're going to put your product in the hands of your consumers that are going to evangelize your product. And the amazing thing about social media is in having consumer-facing products is that we have these massive syndication networks that exist between Facebook and Twitter and Insta Facebook and you know whatever you know whatever whatever Pinterest or whatever else is sort of blooming these social networks the fancy you, if if your consumer becomes passionate about your product they're going to sell it for you you just have to give them the tools to do that so <clears throat> i look at the point of any transaction and whether it's a social transaction where I'm saying where, where, where I'm, I'm, I'm creating a piece of messaging and I'm handing that to somebody else across the internet, that's, that's a cusp, right? And any time where you have that cusp, you have an opportunity for social syndication. So if your product works really, really well and you put it in the hands of original seed users that are going to be passionate about your product and use it a lot, and you give them the opportunity in their transactions, whether it's a financial transaction, an e-commerce, or a social transaction, whether it's somebody trading a photo with somebody else, somebody trading a message, or somebody trading a song, whatever it is, when that cusp takes place, if you give them the tool to syndicate it, and they're a passionate user, they will. And that syndication, if you actually have the right product flow, will create a multiple of return of consumers onto your site and 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 you know really it's a traffic game business right so the more traffic you have on your site the more potential transactions you have the more transactions you have the more opportunity you have for monetization so anytime that you can interrupt that cusp and that flow with the syndication or an encouragement to other people to actually join the platform and or an encouragement for that individual to use the platform more those are your opportunities. Now, gaming that platform becomes, that's sort of the whole trick, right? That's why Mark Pincus built Zenga, because he gamed it extraordinarily well. Every time somebody made a move on a game or passed a level on a game or whatever it was on a game, he would, he would send them algorithmically a message to either one up, share it with somebody, it, make it make an additional transaction, buy some more coins, and he knew exactly, they, they algorithmically figured out the exact points when you want to one-up your customer. And so if, you're, if you create a great product and put it in the hand of passionate consumers, and then, and then you look and you find your cusps, you find your windows to actually intelligently aggregate more audience and a intelligently deeper engage the individual that you have, you'll build, a, you'll, you'll build a, a platform that compounds on itself because every time somebody uses it, you're going to bring in new users and, and or you're going to make a more passionate user out of the one user that you have. It's not really about getting spokesmen. And, and anybody who, who's, who's out looking for spokesmen for their product, maybe, they, maybe their product isn't built good enough. Yeah, spend more time on product. Any other questions uh, today from the audience? I have one um, to, to wrap this up. Uh, Ash and I follow your tweets, and actually your tweets have been known to take down websites is one side effect because <laughs> uh, so much traffic will go there. I think over 10 million followers at this point. Um, you've tweeted in the past about Chegg. Chegg also has an Iowa connection. Uh, founders from Iowa State was launched at Iowa State. Yep. Uh, what does this mean, uh, this investment, and I want to hear from you as well, Ben, what does this investment mean back in your home state where the company is growing, just moved locations to the uh, penthouse of a downtown building, um, received notable 
uh, venture capital money from New York. What does it mean to you to, to be able to invest back in the region, back in Iowa, back in the Silicon Prairie? Well, to me, there's extraordinary talent here. I mean, I went, I went to the University of Iowa School of Engineering, and I was surrounded by people that were all smarter than me. I dropped out. Um, but, it, but, but everybody around me, it, I mean, they were ridiculously highly intelligent people. And, you know, I look at a company like Diwala, and, and there are certain companies that actually, it's even better that they're here. Um, it, it, like it, you can place companies on either the coast and then you have massive wars over you know trying to find talent to actually come into your company you just want a players right and having a company here you have access to a phenomenal number of a players right and the big thing it, it, finding talent here isn't as hard as finding people that are willing to take the risk on something new but the fact that there's such a vast talent field here for recruiting and building a company, I, th I think I think this is a, this is a primary location for a company like Dwalla. The opportunity to be in Iowa gives this company the chance to actually look at an industry that's not necessarily based in Iowa from outside the box. You, you know, if you're if you're a smart finance guy and you're in New York City, you're probably working for Goldman or you know one of these hedge funds doing th that type of stuff. You're a smart engineer because you get paid really well to do that. And so you're already, you're already on the nipple of, uh, of the beast, right? So you, you, can't look at, you can't look at the financial industry from an outside point of view and go, well, how do we break that and build it better? Because it's, it is a broken architecture. We all know it's a broken architecture. But from here, you can. You can be outside the box, look in, and go, well, if I really educate myself on what they're doing and why they're doing it, and I have no, uh, we don't, there's no pony in the race, we can actually build a better company with a new solution. And so I, I think one of the opportunities is here is, is being able to look at broken industries from the outside and rebuild them in ways that people could never think of. And I, I think that that's, that's really powerful. And, and then thirdly, for a company like Dwalla in the financial industry, people here are honest. They're just honest. They understand the value of a day's wage. They know what it's like to work hard. They know what it's like to have a job when you're 13 years old and, and because you, you need to have one because your parents aren't going to give you any money to go buy the things that you want. So they know the value of a dollar and they appreciate the fact that it's your dollar and they appreciate the fact that when you exchange it to somebody else, you don't want somebody siphoning a bunch of cash off of it. And so I, I think that level of honesty and integrity dropped into a company like this, I think it's a really powerful thing. I think, I think Dwala can only be built here. I think there are a lot of companies that can probably only be built here that just maybe haven't been thought of yet, or if they have, the people that have thought of them just haven't been willing to take the risk to actually build it. But I think that that, you know, entrepreneurialism doesn't exist just on the coast. It can, it can exist everywhere, and, and people that are willing to finance those kinds of companies We'll finance them anywhere as long as you have a great vision and, and the ability to execute and 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 you can bring in the talent to actually get it done. I mean, I, I agree, and it was really important for us to find, you know, people to work with and investors who were supportive of where we wanted to build the company um, and who see the value that we see. And I mean, that's just it, man. Like that's why we didn't move. Like I was the right place to build this company. Ash, and how we see around uh, Des Moines in the future here? Uh, Cedar Rapids? Here. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, a big round of applause for Ash and Ben. Uh, that concludes our special segment of Prairie Cast for this week. Do stay tuned. In five minutes, we're going to get back and roll with Jeff and Andy, our regular hosts, chat about what we just chatted about now, as well as some news from around the Silicon Prairie. Thanks again for joining us. Thank you.
Hi there, and welcome back to episode 80 of Prairie Cast. Uh, today is our final Prairie Cast. Just if you weren't here for the beginning, turn off the audio. If you weren't here for the beginning, I'm Jeff Wood of Silicon Prairie News. Uh, this is Andy Broodkull of 48 Web. We are your usual host. We ceded the seat to managing editor of Silicon Prairie News, Danny Schreiber, today um, to interview Ashton Kutcher and Ben Milne uh, to talk about Ashton's investment in Zwolle. Uh, had been rumored before, but this is the first public confirmation of that, and, and we wanted to keep Danny with us today, as well as that, what, 150 people assembled <laughs> yes. um, to talk a little bit about um, what you just about the interview and what, what happened and what this means for Des Moines. Right, so uh, Ashton came on today to confirm uh, his investment in Dewalla through uh, A grade um, and came and participated in the Series B round that they raised in February, $5 million Series B. Uh, leading that round was uh, Union Square Ventures. So um, really interested in uh, why, why Ben uh, chose um, Ashton, as you know, Ashton, I mentioned now around 40 startups that he's invested in. So he does um, get out there and hear pitches and is investing as an active investor. Um, so Ben gave us that answer. And then on the opposite side, we got to hear from Ashton. Mm. And I don't know if I've met a more passionate Dewali user than Ashton <laughs> yeah. Kutcher. That, that was actually my big takeaway. And I was kind of following online the way people were talking about it. And um, like several people even in Des Moines that I know know the Dewali story were like, that's the best explanation of Dewali I've ever heard. So yeah. Um, certainly not. I mean, he plays a lot of roles where he wouldn't be considered an educated venture capitalist, like on you know TV, that 70s show, those types of things. But always impressed. And every person I've ever talked to that actually knows Ashton, uh, like he mentioned, Bo Fishback, we shared a cab at South By with a, a guy who's pretty high up at Apple that, that knows him and just talks about the level of interest he takes in the companies he invests in and what he brings to the table. And you got that out of Ben as well today, kind of what Ashton brings to the table as a dual investor. Yeah, you know, Ben is really excited about having Ashton there, I think, because of Ashton's honesty, um, which uh, Ben alluded to isn't something that we have um, uh, the best talent for, the, the best trade here uh, locally, which is to tell people the honest truth. I think Ashton um, probably cuts through a lot of that BS because he has consistently served a lot of BS in his industry and a lot of this is going to do this and this is going to, but he is, as he said, he, he uses the products a lot. That's probably where he puts in his most time. Um, and so to hear, in fact, it, backstage, I mean, they, they don't stop talking about the product. So I think Ashton is really, if he's going to you know, put a stamp of approval on it, hey, uh, Louis C.K. used Douala, he wants it to be easy. Right. I mean, that's, yeah. <laughs> you know, this recommendation to use Douala, he wants to see it, he wants to see that experience be easy um, for those people that he recommends it to. He can go for that. Yeah. You were trying to say, like, are you going to yeah. can have your buddies when they do these stand-up specials do that? And he, he wouldn't quite go that far. Yeah, you know, and that's, um, I, I don't think he's, in, in Douala itself, hasn't yet quite yet said, you know, we're going to be the best payment system for payroll. Or we're going to be, which is, you know, payroll, 25 cents to pay every employee on that transaction. That's not a bad deal um, for that transaction. Uh, but, yeah, they haven't quite said we're going to be the payment company for coffee shops. Now, they're free to coffee shops, so they're very friendly to coffee shops. And I don't think they're quite ready to figure that out, um, say where the percentage of the user base is at. Uh, and Ashton, he, he comes in, he's going to be the Ashton audience, 10 million Twitter followers um, around that on, on Facebook as well. So you know, who, had, who is the Ashton audience? Did you see the stats at, during I, the live show? I didn't. Well, yeah, and obviously we had the best live show viewing what? numbers ever. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I liked how I liked Ben's answer of why he um, brought in Ashton as an investor. It wasn't because of his 10 million followers. It wasn't the branding and marketing that he's going to bring to the table. It wasn't the mass appeal that he's got. It's the product vision that he has. And the fact that he actually uses the product and gives ideas on how to improve the product is, is why he brought it on. And that, that surprised me a lot. And, and I remember, like, I kind of heard about, the, he talked about the story of how Ashton got involved, and Ben first pitched him um, when they met okay. at yeah. uh, Thanksgiving, right? He said it was his brother's house, and then his dad's garage. Dad's later on. Yeah. That's, that's With a couple of, beers. And, yeah. yeah. Um, and I remember, because there was a tweet out there at Thanksgiving where Ben's like, where do I find whiteboards in Cedar Rapids? <laughs> and, and it was for I that, remember meeting, that, yeah. that meeting. And I asked him one time since then. Well, um, I mean, also, we were thinking, what is... Ben doing in Cedar Rapids. Why is Ben in Cedar Rapids? Yeah. <laughs> this is the analysis you get from Silicon Prairie News. Yeah. Um, but no, talking to him, and he said that, like, and I'd asked him, point blank, like, is Ashton going 
going to be in your next investment round. And he said, you know, honestly, we haven't talked about investment. I'm just floored by the product advice he gives me. Like every time we talk, it's about the product. It's not about like that stuff down down the road. And so, uh, really cool to see that that it all came together. And then obviously, I, I think I experienced that like listening to him talk about Dwala today. Like like I see that product yeah. advice. Yeah, that, that's that was just surprising to me that that was the reason. And and obviously, he's very passionate about the product and all of his companies and his portfolio about their products. And I think that's a great addition. Yeah. But one th oh yeah. I would say, what do you think about, uh, Ashton said he, yeah, talking about his portfolio, he invests in companies that solve problems, right. and he sees Dwala as, he said it basically, I don't remember the exact words, but like, it's a no-brainer, like Dwala is going to solve every financial problem. He, he's that's, also that's looking at, attitude anyway. he's also looking at Big Vision, which is something that Dwala's been really trying to push out there, that they are a network, that this isn't a play uh, about a, a low-cost transaction. This is about the bigger picture of, of being a network, of being a solution, of, of working with the government uh, to provide a new backbone. Mm -hmm. um, so it'll be interesting to see. Um, I, I think you know, one thing I'm fascinated with is, uh, is Ashton's ability to connect with others. He, he, he's talked about it in other interviews um, or who he connects with. Uh, and so it'll be interesting to see if there are connections made going forward that are credited to Ashton's involvement or we see that. So it, it is, and what I want to know is, he got in a little bit of a trouble over laptop stickers on Two and a Half Men. Oh, Are we going to have Dwala stickers now? <laughs> Dwala's got plenty of stickers. So uh, the the Two and a Half Men, yeah, CBS was not getting uh, paid for those uh, more or less endorsements. Probably, so they please. said you need to cut yeah. that. Yeah. So we're not. Um, <laughs> I, did, did Ashton send a tweet out about today? You know, do we did. see? Okay. Yeah. So we saw Ashton putting his name behind Dwala. One thing you can't, uh, personally, I look at uh, Ashton's um, portfolio, uh, Zorley, Hipmunk, uh, Airbnb, these are companies that... Chegg. Chegg. Uh, that was a great point, that like not the first Iowa-based uh, company to start in Iowa that he's invested in. That he's invested in, yeah. Um, so these are companies, these are consumer companies that I've, I've used, um, some of them I love uh, to use, I, I find very useful. So um, I think Ashton is... You know, he's attaching himself to some great brand names. Um, Dwala, also, like I, I mentioned, Mark Echo came in on this route. I mean, you've got a guy who knows fashion and you've got a guy who knows, knows entertainment. Where, what does this mean for Dwala? Right. Yeah. Plus, Fred Wilson and Union Square Ventures, you know, Doesn't leading hurt. it. Yeah. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Um, a couple of different things I heard. Like, uh, there was the disruption theme of Ashton's looking for companies to invest in that are disrupting marketplace, and he sees that. There was the honesty of the company being built here. There was the quote of, Dwala being outside the nipple of the beast, which is an interesting one. Um, what, do you guys, what did you guys take away from that? Like, it sounded like he, there was a vested interest in like I want to know the startup scene in Des Moines. Right, and he said so, uh, and to kind of some like quote him. He said that there's startups that are meant to be built here um, that aren't meant to be built in the vacuum that exists on the in the coast ecosystem. So, uh, I like that idea of we look at problems outside of the box of how someone would look at it if they're actually in the financial industry, and I think he's pretty spot on with that. Yeah, I think uh, that carries over to the focus and then the talent, uh, the ability to acquire talent to join that team here yeah. locally. Um, and you know, to continue to acquire it. Like, I hired up a lot of the Des Moines developers right. and they need, we need to have more people moving in to fill that time. And Dwell is not the only one hiring. There's lots of startups here, especially it's in the CTA finance CTA will yeah. coming soon uh, to Dwell. Web filings. And, and web filings, yeah. uh, another one. Um, you know, major, you two years and major growth out of that company. Um, what about uh, looking at uh, other companies? Do you guys think that uh, it would be Huddle? Uh, we saw the acquisition of Zave Networks uh, from Kansas City. Um, it's really big, though. I mean, it's, I don't know if Ashton is, is totally interested in if Foursquare was built in, in, in this area. Is that something that you look outside the box to connect with your friends right. and, and networks? You know, is that like, where is he? I'd be curious to know where he is going to be looking at next when he comes in. Yeah, well, he mentioned Foursquare was his first investment, right? And um, and I think that was a uh, he, you know he does so he clarify he does have personal investments that he's made in the past, the angel investments, and then the A grade. This one was made through A grade. So that was A grade's first investment was Foursquare. Uh, I don't know the specifics okay. of that one, uh, but you have Ashton's investment history includes both personal investments and then also through A grade. And he, uh, he at one point he said, I I'm going to run out of money if I keep doing my own thing. <laughs> like I have so much interest that it's, it's just, I need to get this thing uh, structured. Yeah, that, um, 
with A grade. Yeah, that, that, that's a good point. Going back to Foursquare and the investment, I mean, I think Foursquare was built uniquely to solve problems in New York City, right? How do people, and not necessarily the problems that we have here, but like when you're out in clubs in New York City, like how do you find your friends? How do you find what's going on? How do you know we're in these big, like that was, we saw Dennis Crowley on stage at Big Omaha a couple years ago talk about that, um, that he never thought that Foursquare would be used to plan play dates in the Midwest which it is being used for, and like how that had altered his vision. But I can imagine Dennis pitching Ashton early on and saying, and, and him identifying, like this is solving a real problem that people in New York City at the time have. And it's obviously morphed into something much bigger and, and with bigger utility than, than what it was designed for. And, and, and I suppose that's probably the hope for Duval as well. Anything else from the, the interview that stuck out for uh, you guys? Um, I know that I, I want to go back and, and really watch it again and, and, pull, and pull out some of the specifics that Ashton had to comment about Duala's system. Yeah. Um, you know, according to, to Ben, this the first time he pitched him was uh, what five months ago or right. four months ago. So we know Ashton's been using the product. Um, I did not Duala with him. I kind of wanted to <laughs> get, a live, a, <laughs> get a, live, <laughs> yeah. a live demo up here on stage, but uh, that did not happen. Well. Um, yeah, five months ago, and he was in the round announced in February, so I'm not sure what, when he actually committed, but it sounds like it was a pretty quick, he jumped on it pretty quick as far as an investor from, yeah. from when he first got the pitch. I just, I just, when they were talking about them in a garage drinking beer on whiteboards, I just keep trying to imagine what, you know, what's yeah. going on. It'd be awesome just to be sitting in the corner of that room and just kind of like watch them go. Yeah, I, I mean, the gentleman that we took, shared the cab with in, in Austin uh, a couple of years ago that was talking about Ashton, without talking about Ashton, like he didn't put together that we were from Iowa and Nebraska, we probably knew who he was talking about as <laughs> famous actor investors from, from Iowa. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> just to see the way that he talked about like analyzing um, investment deals and like sitting down and talking about the specific apps. I think he was talking about Zarly at the time when we were talking to him because they were just, they just been born, you know, it hadn't launched yet. Um, uh, I would love to have that on any of the products that I work on or, or that you work on, I'm sure kind of that. Um, and then the name doesn't hurt. I mean, they kind of danced around the fame and the celebrity and stuff, but that's surely going to be a, a feather in the cap of Dwala's growth, um, as was Fred Wilson, as was Mark Echo, like all the other people that are involved. And Ashton himself continues to be in the room. I mean, the latest was, uh, we didn't, did not get to it, to the, you know, is, will he play be playing Steve Jobs in the upcoming film Jobs, um, the independent film? Um, as he gets more, and it's kind of interesting to see, like, Ashton go from, like personal life, it, his roles now start to involve tech. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Very interesting. And um, yeah, I think that's all I have to say. I, I feel like this is the TMZ episode <laughs> of, of Prairie Cast where we kind of kind of do the wrap up of what this all means. But uh, we do have a, a, a significant amount of the audience to stay around. Do you guys have any observations? Uh, folks are staying around and what you saw and what you heard or positive negatives? I wonder how long it's going to take. Uh, before the uh, blurb of As Ashton Kutcher says, Dwala is cool as shit <laughs> on our website. I quote it. Oh, yeah. oh so yeah, the yeah. testimonial from Ashton Kutcher yeah. on the Dwala homepage. Absolutely. Uh, specifically, cool as shit. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I would use it, like if I was oh, yeah. Jordan, I guess. Well, I'd have t shirts made. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Ray Gun? Yeah. It says just like his headshot. Just his little flexible. Yeah. Very similar to the startup quotes. Uh, Start, yeah. 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 I don't know. It would have been really cool, I think, to hear a little bit more about what, how he thought the ecosystem was going to move forward. Like, I, we didn't get a chance to ask that question, but I would have loved to have heard, you know, how he thought that the the, the investing landscape in Iowa would mature and could get better because obviously that's one of our biggest problems is that we don't have that just churn of capital mm -hmm. that's throwing off companies from hackathons or throwing off companies you know from three guys that work at PayPal or whatever you know yeah. we don't have that churn of capital I would love to hear his kind of take on that and, and what he thought was going to happen or how he thought he could make help. That's, and so it, I'm not sure if the, the live stream is picking up the audience, but the, the question there was, we didn't hear from Ashton what he thought of the future of the ecosystem here and maybe how this investment will change Des Moines or, or not and, and what his role would be. And I think that's a great point. And hopefully he was sincere in I'm going to be around Des Moines. Obviously we had like 90 minutes or something that, that was accounted for time that can be dedicated to this today and it started late and that's just kind of the way that his schedule is so who knows how much time he'll be able to be here but I would love to see that and, and, and see more. You know at that point remember uh, that would have been I think a great question because this is uh, someone who openly admitted he, he came into the, the Silicon Valley really ready to learn. Um, pitched blog girls I think it was in 2009 at TechCrunch uh, got connected there with uh, he said with Ron Conway and kind of has been, I mean, he'll quote Ron Conway on stage is why he, he is interested in, in what he looks at in startups, kind of under his um, guidance there. Uh, I think he stops by incubators um, in San Francisco. So he is uh, 
ingrained. I mean, he's a part of that Silicon Valley scene. Um, is he going to become part of Silicon Prairie scene and see it grow? That's what I'd like to know. Like, is he going to be boots on the ground here? Is he going to be one of that like? Beerhead to actually instigate investing. You know, I think that, that would be, yeah, is he going to be boots on the ground in, in Iowa and in the region? Kind of talking about, well, he's got two investments now in companies that are that have significant presence here with Zarley and, and Dwalla. So. And I'd say, I think um, today's, you know, Dwalla um, really putting this out there for the community to be part of is, it's, I mean, Dwalla could have, you know, come, brought Ashton in, had a one on one at their office, uh, brought a few reporters over to, to cover that, do a photo. But it was more about getting the community out here. And um, I mean, we had two startup questions that were asked. Uh, both of them told, you know, Matthew and Emma, you're able to more or less give a short pitch for your startup. Um, so he's going to start hearing uh, about them. Did and I would have asked the same question of anybody that they would brought in. Like, it would have been great to ask the same question of Fred Wilson or mm -hmm. of anybody that had come in from that round of Mark Echo or whatever. That are there going to be people that now see things like Dwalla happening and want to funnel their money? And regardless of if Ashton Kutcher with his star power or whether it's Fred Wilson with his you know, fame and, and, and quality in the VC industry and, and beyond, it would have been the same question from any one of them, I think. Well, what I would say is what I know of those investors, like none of them are passive people. Like they're, they're very much like they're not just giving up chunk of money and say have fun with it like they're all people that are invested so I think that it's logical to think that would happen and it'd be great to get a commitment for that but uh, I think we kind of run with what we've got so far and see we the Silicon Prairie kind of run with that but one of the advantages you mentioned was that there is not a lot of competition for talent here which a big ecosystem that's churning would create more competition for that so you wonder what his two perspectives there would be yeah I mean that's a chicken and the egg problem right right and, I yeah. Don't even know where you go with that. So what Sarah just said is that there there is not one thing that Ashton brought up is that that that's because there's not as much competition here because there's less activity that's beneficial to dwell and that was kind of the it, it, it pays to be outside um, piece. So so there's yeah chicken and egg and and you you create problems when you solve them as well. And I, I've heard from uh, investors before um, say well there's good things going on in the Midwest but we don't want to talk about them too much because then everybody else will know so uh, I do think this brought a lot of exposure um, to what's going on here this this our Prairie Cat special edition will will go up uh, later today and it will be pushed out to other outlets as well so well should we uh, uh, kind of move into wrapping yeah. up this 80 episode series what, a, what an of, episode to go out on yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> timing worked out well. We scheduled that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Uh, yes, we sure did. Yeah. Yeah. The, the uh, even number of eighty. Uh, the, the celebrity guest, uh, investor. Yeah. Uh, ben Milne, uh, also the first guest uh, on Prairiecast. So, I'll let you guys take it over from here because you two are the the host of Prairiecast from February 2010. Yeah, February 8th was when Ben, February 2010 was our first show. Yeah. Ben was on. Um, we were recording in your spare bedroom on audio, and yeah. Ben called in through Skype, through Skype yeah. which I'm sure Ashton is happy about. Yeah, um, uh, yeah called in through Skype, and that's kind of how we did it. And it was just Ben, maybe Ben and Greg or something at the time. Like, Dwalla was not the Dwalla today back no, then. No, yeah, it was, I think it might have just been Ben at that point. I think and so. it was still kind of idea phase, and we all thought he was crazy. And Look where he's at now. Yeah, <laughs> and Ashton Kutcher makes guest number 71 over those 80 episodes. So uh, typically most episodes had two people. Some episodes just had one. Uh, our largest show, I think, was Big Omaha's kind of review show last year. We had four different people mm -hmm. um, call in. So really kind of weathered a lot of different changes. We started at your house doing audio, and then we went to Webcast One, a now defunct podcasting station, I guess, in Des Moines that uh, and started doing video and doing live shows and then that closed and we went to Des Moines Amplified and mm -hmm. um, that was going on and we kind of pulled out of there and then they closed the next week, yeah. I think, after we left and started just recording in our uh, in our office here in Des Moines and that's the setup plus some that we brought over here today for the last show. And then so moved offices again for last week. That's true. We had one episode in the Dwalla. Old Dwalla. Dwalla. City shutting down after <laughs> <laughs> I had not thought of that, but yeah, <laughs> if, if you get an announcement that Startup City shut down, it was because we had Braycast here. Yeah. So I really apologize for that. Uh, Danny, you've been on the show probably five or six times, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, lots of people were repeat guests, and you were one of them. A lot of the people in the room. Matthew, maybe? The only one that... were You, you weren't on the show, were you? Not okay. Yet. We'll do the reunion show. Yeah. The reunion <laughs> show. Yeah, I think everybody else here has been on at least once. Uh, Emma's been on several times. Uh, uh, so I appreciate you all kind of hanging with us um, and for this last episode. Did you have, well, I'll start with you, Andy. What favorite moments did you have in these last 80 shows? Uh, I think that, that first one with Ben, um, 
where we kind of talked about, we kind of spent like an hour on the whole genesis of the idea. Um, another one we did the same format with Mike Ferrari. Um, Smarty, Smarty Pig. Pig. Social Money Social is money the name of the company now. now. Um, but then it was Smarty Pig and again, it was very early in Smarty Pig. Um, so it was uh, you know just around launch. Um, and so he kind of went through his genesis and that, that's kind of the early shows was, was talking to the founders and, and how they came up with the idea and how they executed on it. And those were, those were some of my favorite ones. Yeah, my favorites were uh, probably more the people that I don't get to see every day. Right. So when we would talk to people that would come in just for it, mm -hmm. uh, Ryan Downs from ProxyBid was the first person that actually sought us out and said, hey, we'd like to, ProxyBid's PR, I think, sought us out and said we'd like to participate in this. So Ryan was great um, to talk to. That was, I think, our first show on Webcast 1 or one yep. of the first ones. Um, we did have, we talked about Shag. Ayush Pumbra, and I probably said his name wrong there, I probably said it wrong to him, but um, uh, who was an Iowa State uh, grad student who really bought Chegg from some other folks at Iowa State that founded it, and then he's the one that built it into the company that is today. You know, I think at the time, TechCrunch had just reported they had a $130 million valuation, and that was all, like, I bought my first apartments air conditioner on Chegg back <laughs> in the day and aim. So it's really cool to see wh where that's going. And that was his first podcast. I remember he told us like he'd never yeah. been on a podcast before. Also the first time that I think we had a PR rep sitting in the room. Right. Like they were in California, but sitting in the room. Um, Monitoring it. Yeah. yeah. Not the last time though, for <laughs> sure. Uh, we had Scott Case from the Startup America partnership come here and, and join us uh, when they launched this space. It was the official grand opening. Uh, right before that, he came and sat in. Uh, I remember he had his crazy shoes on and commented on drinking water from a red solo cup, uh, uh, which was... No, Willie Crazy Shoes? The, uh, the Chuck, Chuck Taylor? Yeah, the, yeah. yeah. the uh, American flag Chuck. Yep. Yeah. Which yeah. actually, I bet if you would Google Sky Case's shoes, you would find them. <laughs> find, I bet you would, because everywhere... <laughs> yeah. You can order them as well. The website. Oh, yeah. okay, yeah. From the Startup America website? No, oh. Yeah, I okay. asked him where he got them. He said he custom made them on yeah. Commerce's website. Nice, nice. We should do that. <laughs> He's going to be here... We're this back week, this right? week, yep, for Ida, Iowa. We got, um, I mean, this is a, a jam-packed week, what they call it, the, uh, the Tri-Tecta? Tri-Tecta. tri, -tecta. tri -tecta the Iowa Tri-Tecta. Yeah, going on. So a lot of startups were participating in uh, Pitch and Grow, as well as uh, Ida, Iowa. I think you're doing a roundup, though, so this I is am, oh, looking right. too far ahead here. I think uh, uh, the other two that, that kind of popped out were uh, Nick Seguin from the Kauffman Foundation, Skyped in, I think from Chicago. He wasn't even in Kansas City when yeah. we talked to him, but I was really impressed with what Nick had to say. It was the first time that I'd talked to him. They were big sponsors, Looking Prairie News. Usually I'm talking with him about logistics, but really to get his opinion and hear what he has to say about startup ecosystems, various stories we were talking about that week was really, really neat. Like, I was yeah. really impressed with Nick. Yeah, I met him at Big Omaha, and I was happy when we got him on the show. Yeah, um, Nick, Nick comes with the... Uh, lots of experience uh, being a part of communities. Uh, he's from, uh, has a company in Columbus, but then also works Columbus, Ohio, and then also works with the Coffin Foundation. So, consistently absorbing things ab about entrepreneurship as well as entrepreneurial communities. And, and he's he's really been a, a great resource for us. And comes on the on the show. It's a good resource for the show as well. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And the, the last one also from Kansas City was Thad Langford from uh, mm -hmm. Entrepreneur in Residence, Open Air Equity Partners, if I have the name of that right. Mm -hmm. But from the venture capitalist standpoint, some of the companies he's invested in and talked about, that was just a few weeks ago, but yeah. it was great to talk to Thad. And you mentioned he, Zave Networks. He was the president when that sold to Google. To Google, yeah. So, And he's really been a part, a big part of uh, pushing and seeing Kansas City um, become, uh, as they say, the America's most entrepreneurial city. Yeah, That's absolutely. <laughs> um, and they got a lot going for them in Kansas City. Uh, Can I get my favorite? Uh, yeah. Are we, are we at that Did point you yet? For that? I, I yeah. feel like I got skipped over because we went with a recap. Yeah, I got my favorite one. Okay, go for your favorite. Uh, I'd say that was probably getting uh, Jordan uh, on camera. So I work with Jordan a lot. Um, I work with uh, a lot of startups. Jordan Lampy from Jordan Lampy yeah. from, from Dwella. Uh, I mean, my my role is consistently communicating with startups, and so Jordan here. Um, the news was broken by Betabeat that um, uh, there was an investment made from Union Square Ventures and like the next day he was scheduled to be on Prairie yeah, right. And so uh, it was great timing and you just saw him squirm in that chair I think for the first 20 <laughs> minutes. Um, and also there was an episode in which Jordan had to suddenly take off. Uh, yeah. Was there uh, an emergency uh, there midway was, through? There was the thought that his wife was going into labor. But that's it, yeah. He got a text. Was that the same show? So no, those are different shows. No, those shows. are different shows. Okay, yeah. It would have been well timed if that was the same. Yeah. Oh, okay, guys, yeah, I gotta sorry. go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so those were you know, Jordan Lampy provides some dramatic broadcast. Yeah, he, for he, us. and of course really he was a big part of today's show as well. And the first time we had Jordan on was actually uh, I forgot about this. We had a 
we were blizzarded out one day that um, like everybody canceled because there was a blizzard in Des Moines that day. So I was frantically calling people that I know live downtown to see if I could <laughs> walk to the studio. And, oh, that's um, great. I think it was Nathan Wright and yeah, Jordan uh, that came on. Uh, Nathan's been on five. He probably yeah, yeah. he might have the most of any one person. It might be Nathan. Um, any guess on which company had the most different people? I would guess Walla. Yeah, but. you would guess right. <laughs> but um, they didn't all they didn't all work there at the time though. That's true. Right? Right. Which is because yeah. Sharice was on the show, but it was before Dwalla. Yeah. Before she was with Dwalla. Uh, Ben's obviously been on the show. We talked about that, uh, Jordan, and then Sam DeRegger started on the show before Dwalla, and then they hired him. So they kind of he was on the show one day when he was with Dwalla, but he didn't tell you. He didn't happen to tell you guys right. that. I think he or announced he knew. it like he like knew. the day before they announced that that he was joining Dwalla, and so yeah. we had like Jordan and Sam on on the same show, um, <laughs> both working for Dwalla. Uh, and I think number three might be or the next might be the register. I was thinking about that because we've had Marco Santana on the show. We've had Adam Bells. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, Tim Pollock canceled on us three times, <laughs> uh, including the day that he got the job to be the lifestyle yeah. editor. Like He's like, I got to go. Our lifestyle editor has left, and, and I need to go do this. So, <laughs> um, And then, uh, uh, as well as Chris Snyder, but that was after he left the register that Chris Snyder was on the yeah, show. Brad Dwyer on Brad Dwyer. We've had Brad Dwyer on yeah, the show. Oh. Volunteer local. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. And you've got. Like did we have Jeremy on the show yeah. too? Did you have Jeremy? I don't think, I don't we've, think had we've had Jeremy. But yeah, that volunteer local would have three. So with Brian Hemisath, uh, Brad Dwyer, and then uh, myself. Anybody else? Well, Notify works too because we've had uh, Rush, Colwell, and and yourself. So there's three from. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I, it's kind of funny. Like it's nice to be able to come to Star City and just kind of wrap this up because so much of. Yeah. Uh, the people that have been involved in the show are, are camping here, and, and so much of the people that were at the audience today are, are taking part. So this is this is a nice place to do this. Um, I think that's all I have for today. It? Any other things you want to wrap no up on the show? No fast four? No fast four. No, no <laughs> fast four. The, the favorite segment? I should have done it. Seriously, I, li I really enjoyed that segment, and uh, the point system, and the winner. and. Well, we still have all the equipment in the office, so we can do fast fours for this. Yeah, so what, <laughs> what's yeah. the question? Where, where is Prairiecast going? Is it going to come back? Uh, what's the... Uh, the intention for Prairiecast is not to come back. Okay. Um, so we, we say indefinite hiatus. We have all the equipment, so I think that when... Fashion's in town next week, and he wants to get on live camera and talk. Like we have the ability to do that, and we'll keep that set up in our office and in a way, um, or anybody else. That wants yeah, to do that. I mean, frankly, if if you have a, a announcement to make, and you have a special guest in town, or you want to, uh, if you think it, you know, talking about your startup in an interview style with uh, the studio would be good, that's where you got to. You know, contact Jeff, contact us. That's what we have. And that equipment's been used for, I think it's live streamed a couple Dwalla events and different things. So if you do have use for it, let us know, and, and we want to get the word out for sure. Um, uh, but yeah, the the idea, and really, a lot of people have tweeted, and I haven't got back to everybody, like, why is Praycast ending? Uh, I'm glad that people like it. Um, I know that you didn't all watch last week, because I talked about it ending, and people were surprised that, that, it, that it happened today. Really, uh, uh, my time is more on the business side of Silicon Prairie News, and it wasn't, it was more on content when we started. And so, it was a bit harder and harder to prepare the show, and kind of take it another step up, which we wanted to do. Um, so it, w it was a decision um, that I kind of came to, and this team supported it, and Andy was cool with it. So we just kind of all ha have come to this. and, and um, But yeah, that doesn't mean we won't do more podcasts. We won't do more live things. We're, we got the equipment, so let's use News it. News production is not stopping either. The presses are going. <laughs> but, uh, there's been some uh, important people, I think. Uh, there, uh, we got our news team. Uh, Michael Stacy provides all of the content, so you've been talking about him. But I think... And he has great puns. <laughs> yes. Uh, Michael makes great jokes. You guys should all read our paper. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, um, so t yeah, tell, tell us about some of the, as we wrap things up, who really puts on for ACAST? Who really puts on Prairie Who really puts on Prairie Cast? Um, well, you and I and Michael kind of brainstorm, mm -hmm. uh, come up with the topics on Fridays typically, and then it bring Andy in and kind of look at things. Andy comes up with a stat of the week. That's where we got there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but really our whole team is kind of involved. So we've had everybody from SPN, except for our current interns, I think, have all been guests on the show. Yeah, we should have, yeah. I didn't so think about that. And, and then John yeah. also. And John, oh, big part. Is that where you were going? Yeah, I was going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was John, you, the big I, shout out to John back there with, I, with the more involved. Yeah. yeah uh, I actually was peeking at your sheet I saw I skipped saw that one sorry John uh, so in, as well the as the, the camera also sometimes he's yelling at you I feel like yeah yeah and more he, hand he, signals and he, we have a whiteboard behind him so he can write on the <laughs> board like things we're supposed to be talking about that we miss um, yeah we've actually had five engineers 
six engineers, five that I've counted. So uh, Andy was the first engineer, mm -hmm. and we still use some of the early days equipment. Yeah. Uh, John Thompson, who is going to be on camera here in a second, I think, as I see him. <laughs> John is the current engineer. Find out more about John at dmevolve.com. That's kind of in our wrap up. Also, Esme Lejeune and Max Crab when we were on Webcast One, and then Brett on Des Moines Amplified, who's I don't remember Brett's last name. Neither. But uh, big kudos to those guys because we called them the day, like we found out on Friday at 5 that Webcast 1 was dead and we had a show on Tuesday and it was the big Omaha preview show, right. like it was one that we were really working on. So we called him up and he's like, yeah, we can have you on Tuesday. So he really helped us out um, there. But yeah, that's, is, is that everybody that helps us I put it on? I think so, yeah. All right. Um, Good well, crew. We go ahead and wrap up the last show then, I guess. So that's it for today's show, and that's it for PrairieCast. Thanks, everyone, for joining us online. When I last looked, there were still like 300 of you that are probably wondering what it is that we're talking <laughs> about right now. Where'd Ashton go? Uh, yeah, where's Ashton? Uh, <laughs> Danny, where can people find out more about you online? Uh, SiliconPrairieNews.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Danny Away. And Ashton? Uh, Ashton is A plus K. On Twitter. On Twitter. Yeah, go look there. Andy? You met Andy.com. I met gwood.me. Precast was produced by John Thompson of Evolve. Find out more on his services at dmevolve.com. For all the news and culture related startups on Silicon Prairie, go to siliconprairienews.com. And thanks everybody for uh, joining us these past 80 episodes. Yep.